Good evening, and welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Dave Rosenstein. I'm a member of Community Board 8 and your host for uh, tonight's show. Uh, Community Board 8 covers the Upper East Side from 59th and 96th Street, as well as Roosevelt Island. Our guest this month is City Council Member Benjamin Kalos, newly elected to Manhattan's 5th City Council District. Ben, welcome. Thank you for having me. And ben is an attorney, a graduate of SUNY Buffalo School of Law. Uh, not surprising for someone who started a computer consulting business when he was a teenager. Ben attended the Bronx High School of Science. Ben was actually a member of our community board before joining then Assemblyman Jonathan Bing as chief of staff. He has also served as director of policy for former New York City public advocate Mark Green and executive director of the Good Government Group, New Roosevelt. Uh, could we put a map of Ben's 5th District up on the, um, on the monitor? As you can see, it covers much of our community board as well as Roosevelt Island. Ben, welcome again, and congratulations on your election and on your new marriage. Thank you. Uh, let's start with an overview. What are the issues most important to you and where you think you could make a difference? What's your priority list? Well, th first, David, thank you for having me as a guest on this show. Thank you for your work on the community board through these years. It's a volunteer position. You have to apply for it. <laughs> and uh, you don't get paid anything, but you have to go to all these meetings. So I want to thank you. I also want to thank the viewers for watching uh, from home to learn more about their community and about our city. Uh, so I'm, I'm the new council member. I'm Ben Kalos. Uh, you can tweet me at Ben Kalos. You can call me at 212-860-1950. You can drop by my office at 244 East 93rd Street. We're in the old Weight Watchers, and we can even help you lose weight. But uh, in terms of the priorities, uh, it's stopping the Marine Transfer Station. Uh, it's on 91st Street. It's right next to Asphalt Green. It actually uh, has a road going through the middle of it, so you have a swimming pool that trains Olympic athletes like Leah Neal, who won a bronze medal, and a soccer field and a gymnastics uh, facility where we had performers at my inauguration. Uh, I'm a member there. I'm a member of Asphalt Green's triathlon team. And a residential neighborhood, let alone a, a children's park, is not a place for a marine transfer station. Uh, beyond that, where I'm working with Pledge to Protect and community leaders like you and the community board uh, who are opposing uh, the Marine Transfer Station, uh, I, I'm also focused on seats in schools now. Uh, community School District 2 is overcrowded. We don't have enough seats. Uh, we've built new schools. While I was Chief of Staff for some of Jonathan Bing, we started that process. A lot of them have opened, but we're still overcrowded. We still don't have enough seats. Uh, I had a chance to work with Ryan Lander, which is a nursery in our district, uh, when they lost their space to try to find a new one, and I'm glad that they did. And I'm trying to uh, take innovative models like Millennium High School, which the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, supported in turning a commercial space uh, downtown near Wall Street into a thriving high school, one of the best in the country. And I think that's a model that we can investigate and uh, do some pop-up schools. Other importantly, my mother lives in the district. She happens to be a senior. I want to support senior services, keep our senior centers open. Uh, and many other items like making sure that our, our office is open and accessible to the community. This morning we were uh, available, uh, February 7th. Uh, this morning we did it. We're doing it again March 7th. We do First Fridays with Ben. And we had 50 members of the community stop by and tell us about what their priorities are what was important. So whether it's on Twitter, by phone, stopping by in person, or first Fridays with Ben, it's March 7th at uh, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., 244 East 93rd. You're invited to join us. Please call our number to RSVP. I was going to ask you later on, but, but I, I know that you've been tracking this uh, Second Avenue subway and the, the problems that it's caused, and it's also got the potential for both good and problematic effects on our community. One of, one of my concerns is that what's going to happen to the businesses as five-story walk-ups are torn down and high-rises go up, as the land values go up. Um, the West Side has done some creative things. Uh, have you started looking at that? Uh... 
Ab absolutely. So I was Assembly Member Jonathan Bing's chief of staff when they started the construction of the Second Avenue subway. And we uh, worked with the community to launch the Second Avenue uh, Business Association and also with the MTA to launch Shop Second Avenue. And the idea was at first just to try to keep as many of those stores open. Uh, a lot of them have closed during the construction. Uh, while I was some of them being chief of staff, I got to work with him on uh, very creative legislation that actually passed both houses of the legislature that would have created a grants program to mm -hmm. keep some of the stores open. So fast forward. That was vetoed by Governor Patterson. That's correct, but I'm hoping to introduce a similar version on a city level because 2016 is coming. December 2016, the Second Avenue subway will start running. And uh, as it expands southward, I want to make sure that we protect businesses there. But in the meantime, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, they've stopped the blasting as of last year. So I think we're all very excited. But you're right. Uh, our neighborhood's about to change a lot. And if you walk along Second Avenue, you will see a lot of empty uh, buildings. Mm -hmm empty lots. Uh, I can see that they're warehousing a lot of real estate. A lot of that was affordable housing, too. So what I'm hoping to do is, as those walk-ups that were affordable are replaced with these high-rises, I want to make sure that there's mandatory affordable housing. That's something that other council members uh, have made a priority, as well as our mayor. And I think that there must be room for middle-income New Yorkers to have a place on the Upper East Side that gets built up around the new 2nd Avenue subway. And that also includes uh, local businesses, mom and pops, locally owned and operated. And whether it's exploring creative solution like council member now Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer did on the west side, uh, which restricted storefronts so that they were uh, narrower storefronts instead of whole block larger storefronts. Uh, that's something I'm happy to explore with the community board. We've got a lot of small businesses that would disappear if the only spaces available were huge and and, and costly. Absolutely. Uh, when Ben left the community board, uh, he continued to serve on as what is known as a public member. Um, anybody who's interested in getting involved with community boards, the board chair can appoint two public members to specific committees. Their vote doesn't register in the final decision as to whether a resolution passes or not, but um, they have a role and and contribute. And and Ben was on our committee, on communications committee, doing what I'm doing, interviewing people. But more important, uh, when our website began to become very costly to maintain because we had a, a contractor who, whose costs were increasingly going up, um, Ben stepped in and volunteered to build a new CB8 website at no cost to the board. Uh, until he assumed office as a city council member in January, Ben has been our webmaster again with, without asking for anything, compensation, expenses, or even public recognition. So on behalf of the committee and, and community board, eight, thank you. Um, thank you. But you couldn't have done it if you didn't have this background in technology. Uh, I think it's safe to say you're probably one of the most knowledgeable council members on Internet issues and technology. Uh, you've done a lot of work building public interest websites, I've read, that uh, support government transparency. For this interview, um, I searched the city's websites to try to learn more about the city uh, council's committee on governmental operations, which uh, you were named to chair. I found it impossible to get a good sense from those websites as to what the committee does. So my first question is, would you have an opportunity to use your Internet knowledge to... Uh, help make the council's work more accessible to the public through the internet? A absolutely. First, I just want to encourage any of the viewers. Uh, in January, you can always apply to be a member of the community board. Uh, you apply with the borough president in your respective uh, borough. Here it would be Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Uh, if you missed the January deadline, please consider becoming a public member. Community Board 8 has public members on all of its committees from uh, Street Life Committee, where you're dealing with liquor licenses, to Communications Committee, where you can help get the word out. And uh, I know that uh, David, Will, and Monica, and others work so hard on public programs like this, and newsletters, and, and you name it. So first, thank you, and thank you for being one of the committees that usually has public members. And it's a great way to get involved before you apply and get a taste of what the community board entails. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to apologize that the City Council website uh, was difficult and didn't really uh, 
have an easy to understand explanation of what the Government Operations Committee uh, does. Uh, as part of rules reform that I uh, have been working on with 30 other council members, uh, we would like to make sure that our web and our other outreach is uh, more easily accessible and mm -hmm. understandable. So that's something that we are making a priority. Uh, the Government Operations Committee, I call it the Good Government Committee, uh, has oversight over 11 agencies or commissions. Uh, so one of those groups is actually the community boards. So I want to make sure that community boards have the resources they need to provide a, a, be a resource for their community. Uh, I also will have oversight over the Board of Elections uh, where I want to make sure we expand the franchise and have more people voting in elections. Uh, oversight over campaign finance. New York City has a public matching system. I wouldn't be here without it. I had over 1,000 people contribute to my campaign. The most frequent contribution was $10. In, in the face of anything else, uh, empowering people to give $10 and have a council member or mayor of their choosing is amazing. I also have oversight of the Board of Standards and Appeals. Uh, members of the community board are familiar with it. Uh, people watching may not. But they're responsible for granting variances from zoning. And what I'd like to do is make sure that the community board's voice is heard and shouldn't be overturned very often, if not at all. So those are some of the things that government operations has a say over. And in terms of my technology background, I'm the only developer. I, I do software development on the city council, so I'm a lawyer, but city council member, also a software developer. And I hope to, to lend that knowledge to make sure that the city uh, starts to work to rebuild the trust between government and residents. And I want to make sure that technology is used for transparency, but the technology should be invisible so that we have, as residents, a seamless experience where government just works. As part of that, um attempt to make our city government more open, uh, does that bring up things like um, a regular channel for uh, the city council so that we're not just seeing little slices and pieces of it, uh, maybe online uh, uh, cable casting of uh, community board meetings? And we've struggled with how, who would pay for it, who would do the work, uh, who would handle the, the back-end uh, technology. So. Uh, Great question. Council member Jessica Lappin, who I'm succeeding, actually carried the bill before me in the city council to have uh, webcasting specifically of community board meetings. Uh, the chair of the technology committee, Jimmy Vaca, who I'm looking forward to working with very closely on issues like this, has reintroduced that legislation. And I, I hope to sign on and just make sure that any thing that we are legislating in the city council does not become an unfunded or burdensome mandate, but make sure that right. the community boards have the resources that you need to do your jobs. Uh, something that I'm hoping to work with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and in fact the mayor with is creating a technology infrastructure to support uh, websites for all 59 community boards. The uh, technology that we use to build community board eight with an hour or two of work could be uh, create a, a a website for all 59 community boards, and what that means is that there would be a, a universal standard for what community boards could use, and any of them could opt into using their own. But it would be a default basic website that everyone could use, which would have many many features, including something like location aware notifications. So if somebody puts up a uh, liquor license application, you could sign up on the website and get told, hey, uh, a block away from you, somebody just applied for a liquor license application. The technology is there. We can do it as a city. It's just a matter of making it available as a resource for community boards. That would be great. I mean, we post notices all the time, all over the place, and yet people still come to committee meetings and say, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that bar was going to open, or I didn't know that bar was still there. It's been, it's been a problem. Um, so that kind of, of localized, uh, targeted uh, information would be, uh, uh, would be very helpful. I need to ask you about a, a matter of concern to a number of elderly folks across the city, particularly in your district. Uh, tenants in the former Mitchell Lama High Rise, known as uh, Knickerbocker Plaza, 91st Street and 2nd Avenue, were uh, notified last July that the longstanding guidelines were changed, and now that they are 
deemed to be overhoused. It would have to move, uh, for example, uh, a widow who lost her husband now has to lose her bedroom. The city has been using what's called enhanced Section 8 vouchers uh, to help these lower income residents keep their homes after the buildings dropped out of the Mitchell Lama uh, program, which I think about half or more of Mitchell Lama buildings have, have, have uh, given up that uh, uh, status. Uh, to ask an elderly person who thought they had affordable housing to move from one bedroom into a studio, dispose of their furniture, struggle with a move at an advanced age, it seems like a cruel way to uh, trim a budget. Is there any way that uh, without a billionaire in the mayor's office, uh, the city could show a little sensitivity here, maybe grandfather this generation of tenants and apply the new guidelines to tenants moving in rather than those who were told they were in compliance? Absolutely. Uh, the seniors you're speaking about are the people who moved uh, into the Upper East Side, made it, is, made it what it is today, made it the destination, and in a large part are becoming victims of their own success because they did such a good job as part of the urban renewal projects and investments into this community that now everyone wants to live here and they're getting priced out of their homes. And that's not fair. That's not right. I'm working with the Housing Alliance Against Downsizing, which is a citywide coalition. I actually was meeting with them earlier today to raise awareness around this issue. Uh, no senior deserves to get downsized from uh, their home where they've raised a family and lived down to a zero bedroom apartment. And uh, what's worse is then put a, making a, a 90 year old or older widow move into a studio, and I, I really don't think anyone should have to live in a studio unless they choose to, is they're telling people, more, more than one person, so if you're, you're, you have, you're living with your sister, uh, they will tell you you have to go into a studio. And I, I, I love my sister, but I don't want to have to share a studio with her. So it's one of those things that I'm looking forward to working with, uh, both the mayor, other council members, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, uh, to call on HUD and HPD to stop this practice immediately because uh, we can find a lot more, we can find the money in the budget to avoid this. There, there's no reason we need to balance the budget on the backs of seniors. I mean, ultimately, HPD is a city mayoral uh, agency, but the mayor is a supporter of affordable housing. And uh, with enough of a, of a uh, urging from like-minded elected mm -hmm. officials, Hopefully he can suggest to HPD that they look at the priority list that HUD gave them and find another way to save this, uh, these funds. Now, you're in an interesting uh, position because normally a new legislator is way down on the, on the seniority list. Uh, but in this city council, you're one of 21 new members out of 51. That's more than 40 percent of the council is new. Mm -hmm. What does that mean in terms of the likelihood that you can connect, network, build alliances, be effective right out of the gate? One of the most amazing things is I'm now chair of the Government Operations Committee. I am the first freshman council member to ever chair that committee. And our borough president chaired it, Gail Brewer. Gail Brewer did, did chair it ahead of me, and I, I have some big shoes to fill there. So what we're seeing is great opportunity for freshman council members. There are 21 of us, and a lot of us come to the table with experience. I was a chief of staff for assembly member Jonathan Bing. A number of them are chief, were chiefs of staff for the council members uh, whose seats they filled. Additionally, we actually have assembly members who are now sitting next to us as peers in the city council. So what we've seen is a, a lot of freshman council members who are hitting the ground running. Uh, we also have a group called the Progressive Caucus, which is a group of like-minded council members, some freshmen, some more senior members, who have a similar set of values. Uh, and that means uh, making the city a little bit more fair for everyone. So we're focused on things like universal pre-K so that everyone gets a fair, head, a fair start in life and affordable housing and paid sick leave so that you don't have to choose between staying healthy and keeping your job. And those are just some examples, but there's so many of us now in the council that I think we really have an amazing opportunity between a progressive membership, a progressive speaker, a progressive mayor, uh, to really make sure that the city serves its residents again. That's exciting. 
Uh, your predecessor, uh, Jessica Lappin, was a, a strong advocate for uh, women's health issues on the council, education as well, but we've already covered education. Her advocacy on that issue is going to be missed, but I suspect that you have an interest in this area as well. Before any of this, I was an attorney. I uh, actually went to SUNY Buffalo Law School where I studied under Lucinda Finley, who is one of the preeminent scholars on feminist jurisprudence. Uh, I went into law and I was a labor and employment attorney, and I actually got to work on uh, equal pay for women as well as sexual harassment and making sure that women in the workplace could feel safe and be respected as equals. Uh, now that I'm in the city council, I'm keenly aware that we did lose a woman in the city council, and I do think that we need to have equal representation in the legislature. Uh, we should be at 50-50 because -50 that's what our population, actually there's more women living in New York uh, than men. So uh, I'm keenly aware of it, and in order to fill Jessica's large seats, I'm at large uh, shoes, I am, uh, I, I'm focused and I, I joined the Women's Issues Committee. I'm actually the only man on the Women's Issues Committee. And on that, uh, I'm focused on education, which we already touched on in universal pre-K. And part of that is because I was raised by a single mother, uh, Dr. June Kalos. And I don't want uh, single mothers in New York City to have to choose to make the same types of sacrifices that my mother uh, had to make to raise me. Uh, uh, single moms should have full day pre-K so that they can work and their kids can get a fair start. I'm also uh, pretty focused on reproductive health and making sure that uh, uh, women have access to, to choice. And I, I am pro-choice. And uh, anything we can do to increase reproductive health throughout the city will do. And uh, people can actually... Uh, my, my office is a registered uh, location to pick up NYC condoms. So, again, anything we can do for reproductive health, we'll be doing. You mentioned uh, uh, single parents. One of the uh, groups that the, the, the overhousing is targeting is single parents who are being told you can have the one bedroom, your child can have the bedroom, and you can sleep on the couch or vice versa. Right. <laughs> No parent should have to make that choice, and uh, as awkward as having to, to uh, two adults uh, having to share a room with, for instance, my sister, um, I think it would be even more awkward for a parent and a child to have to share a one bedroom. Uh, they should be able to stay in their two bedrooms, and people should be able to maintain their dignity. Let's go over to York Avenue. Um, with the marine transfer station threatened at one end and the hospital development just growing and growing and growing, uh, at the other end, actually, now that uh, the m m Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, CUNY complex is going up between 73rd and 74th Street along the FDR Drive, the hospital development has crossed the 72nd Street line. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been pressure on that area. The community board has talked uh, not favorably about York Avenue becoming a one-way street. That is something that concerns people who live there because having a two-way street slows everything down and keeps a sense of neighborhood. On the other hand, the traffic is unbelievable, particularly south of 72nd Street, going to the 59th Street Bridge with ambulances. And Are we doomed to have a four-lane expressway going down York Avenue? I love Yorkville. I, I grew up there. Uh, my, my grandparents and now my mother lived on 72nd Street between 1st and York. Uh, I grew up on 88th in York uh, while the Marine Transfer Station was there, and now I live on 80th in York. And part of the reason that I'm there and I've been attracted to that part of the neighborhood is because, A, that's where a lot of our affordable housing is. That's where a lot of our six-story walk-ups are. That's where a lot of our seniors living in that affordable housing are. And York just seems to have a different sort of character than First Avenue or Second Avenue or any of the other major thoroughfares. And in part, it's because of that uh, street, and so it shouldn't become just a, a highway down to the bridge. So I'm working to make sure that we protect the character of the neighborhood and make sure that seniors who live in the neighborhood who have liberal mobility will always have the M31 going in both directions along York Avenue so that they can go downstairs, get mm -hmm. on the M31, get taken to where they need to get in the city and have that bi-directional service on York so that they don't have to walk an entire avenue. So anything we can do to protect the unique character 
and integrity of Yorkville uh, will be working to do and uh, hope to work with the community to make that happen, especially Community Board 8. I can't interview without asking about the, the Esplanade. It's yes. something that drives east siders crazy because we have uh, west side envy. Riverside Drive is, mm -hmm. is wonderful. It runs all the way down. It was Ruth Messenger's dream. The dream is kind of stumbling on the east side. Uh, the Esplanade is a mess. It's practically falling into the river. Uh, there was a re press report last week that most of the money going into the city parks is from private groups like Central Park Conservancy. Uh, we struggle to get money from institutions that are expanding, like uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering CUNY is going to give some money to support a park at the south end of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of our district. The waterfront is hugely important. Uh, the East River Esplanade is actually falling into the river. I, I generally go running on the Esplanade, and folks are willing, welcome to join me. Just call my office. I uh, will generally get on near Gracie Mansion. I'll run up northbound until I hit the bridge, uh, turn around, run south to 59th Street, and just keep going until I have hit the number of miles I need to cover that day. And there are places where there, there's no longer an Esplanade. You have to walk through dirt because the Esplanade has fallen into the river. Uh, it's a multi-million dollar project that we need to fund, and the sad reality is just the upkeep is in the hundreds of millions, but if we don't even do the upkeep, the, the price will double or quadruple. So it is something that I'm, I'm working closely with. Uh, Jessica Lappin was the co-chair of the East River Esplanade Task Force. I'm proud to try to fill her shoes there and take over as co-chair and work with Congresswoman Carol Maloney and members of the community board to address this problem. What we need is a master plan, and we need to work with stakeholders in the community and the hospitals along the East River Esplanade to make sure that we support that infrastructure and that the city puts the money where they need to and the federal government needs, puts the money there so that we can have an Esplanade that uh, does provide the park space that we do need because this district actually has some of the least park space of any district in the city. So it, it is a high priority, and uh, we have a task force devoted to it that I chair with the congresswoman. I look forward to taking it on and getting it addressed. We're just about out of time. Um, this has been great. Thank you. Thank you.